Thank you for turning to 10, your news leader. 10 News Conference with Gene Valicenti continues right now. Rhode Island's presidential primary preference is April 2nd. Rhode Island Secretary of State Greg Amore joins me in studio to talk about that and other things on his agenda. Mr. Secretary, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. You know what? Why don't we get to some dates? Uh, the first order of business, voter registration. If you want to vote, the deadline is March 3rd. Let's put that up on the screen and you talk about that. And not only registration, but if you want to change your party affiliation, that is the date to do that. So if you want to vote in the Republican primary, but you're a registered yep. Democrat or, or unaffiliated, unaffiliated voters can go in either way. But that is the deadline for uh, change in affiliation as well. Right. You can, we allow that uh, we do. in this state. We and do. by the way, if you vote in one party, you can disaffiliate on the way That's out. Correct. Remember to do that. We're promoting legislation that would even change that. So that if you came in unaffiliated, yep. you'd leave unaffiliated. There'd be no form to fill out. Uh, you would show up unaffiliated and leave unaffiliated. It passed the House last year. We hope it passes the Senate this year. Well, that's interesting because now you walk out with a receipt, right? And, and you hope that they keep track of it. By the way, I've never had a problem. They always no, keep tra I, they always keep track of it, but they do give you a receipt like the dry cleaner. Yeah, we, we yeah. think it encourages people to vote. They, right. they don't. Some people don't want to be associated with the Democrats or the Republicans, so uh, they have this opportunity to do that and and feel good about the fact that they're leaving the way they came in, unaffiliated. Yeah. Now, so deadline. Uh, to register March 3rd, mail-in ballot application deadline March 12th. They can put that up on again. We'll put the dates on and help the people through this. March 12th. March 12th. And you can apply for that through our office at vote.ri.gov. Yep. Online, you put your ID number in and, and you can apply for the ballot. Or you can do it by mail uh, on, a, on a traditional form that you can download from our website. Or you can go to your local city or town hall right. canvassing uh, department and do it that way. Okay. All of this is leading up to the presidential primary, Republican primary, Democrat <laughs> primary. Put that date up. That is coming up when, Mr. Secretary? Right. April 2nd, but there's early voting that precedes that, in-person early voting at the city and town halls, and that yep. starts on March 13th. Okay, now that is, uh, well, that's convenient for some people, controversial for right. others. This is where you can go, go to your town hall, your city hall, Correct. they'll take your ballot, you're done. Correct. And how, how, how much earlier can you go now? Yeah, so, so it's, it's 20 days in total, but it's not 20, day, 20 actual days. So um, you can go Monday through Friday to your city or town hall during yeah. regular business hours. Some cities and towns, and they'll advertise this soon, will be open on one of those Saturdays. I would guess less for the presidential preference primary because there will be a lower turnout for this. Right. Now, in the Republicans, some people have dropped out. How many names on the ballot, if you happen yeah, to know? Yeah, there are five. Uh, so none of the candidates that dropped out yep. met the deadline to withdraw from the race in Rhode Island, so they're all on there. All the big yep. names are on there, Trump, Haley. Ramaswamy, uh, Christie, uh, DeSantis, they're all on the ballot. And if you vote for Ramaswamy, does that vote count, even <laughs> though he's dropped out? What, what do you do with yeah, that? Yeah, that, that's the nature of, of this process. Yeah. That's, that's why some of the folks are pushing for ranked choice voting, at least in presidential preference primaries, so that you'd have, your vote would count nonetheless. But uh, some people will vote for all of these candidates, but they didn't yeah. meet the deadline, they're on the ballot. And on the Democrat side, well, that's just, your party. Just two, uh, President Biden and then Dean Phillips. Right, Dean Phillips. Uh, the independent candidates will go through this process in June uh, to access the ballot. So they'll do the nomination uh, papers in June. People like uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Right, right. Now, uh, you know, you handle the elections as the Secretary of State, but so does the Board of Elections. Right. Now, I know the difference, but those joining us may not. So explain your role quickly and then the Board of Elections role. Sure. We're, we're, we're tasked with maintaining the voter registration rolls. Uh, so that's that's our primary objective. And then we are the advertising agency for elections, right? We get the public information mm -hmm. out there to make sure the folks know these dates, and you're helping with that uh, that today. Right. Uh, the board does the actual election. So when, when elections occur, early voting and then beyond, the board is in charge of that because you don't want a politician uh, counting votes or determining uh, who can and can't be on a ballot based on yes. disputes. Right, and the board has the machines. They do. In their possession. They do. Now, you know, you mentioned the, the voter rolls. There's always been yeah. jokes about about people in cemeteries voting. In fact, it's not a joke anymore because we saw dead people were on Sabina Matos's right. uh, election papers. Were well, you very disturbed by that? Sure. As the Secretary sure. of State, forget that you're a politician, sure. you're a Democrat, she's in your party. Yeah, I sure. think it's the Secretary of State. Sure. And, and, and I think I, I, I was one of the first to come out and say that the board should review those signatures in real time, yep. not wait for the challenge process. Uh, and, and we've promoted legislation that will force the board to do that, and we think we have a good chance of getting that passed. I think what was not reported during that process is all of those deceased folks' names, yes. they were not on our voter rolls. So they would have been crossed off those lists regardless. They were not listed as a Rhode Island voter at that time. They were marked as deceased. And, and that's good news for our voter rolls yeah. process. Uh, but obviously, forgery is unacceptable. What are you doing to maintain those rolls? For example, people move from town to town, they don't switch. People move from state to state, they don't switch. They don't. Sure. It's something you never get around to doing. So we're, we're part of ERIC, which is a 
almost nationwide system where we compare data from other mm -hmm. states. Uh, we also get the, the data from the Social Security Administration, et cetera, and we try to make those updates in real time. Also, any elections mail that is sent that is returned, uh, we can put that voter on the inactive list. Uh, at the beginning of our administration, we removed uh, 60,000 plus voters from our rolls based on the fact that we had sent applications, mail ballot applications, to every registered Rhode Island voter. When those came back undeliverable, mm -hmm. we pulled those people off after two federal election cycles. We continue to send out that elections mail to make sure these ballots are, uh, these uh, rolls are clean. Okay, you know the early voting mail-in ballots, they say that favors the Democrats. We've seen that it has favored the Democrats yeah. in Rhode Island. Yeah, they've embraced, you know, Aaron they've embraced Gu it. Aaron Gouki and the Republican, he beat uh, Sabina Matos' day of voting. He did. Uh, Helena Folks in the primary beat uh, Governor McKee day <laughs> of voting. Yeah. But if you play the game very well with early, early voting and mail-in ballots, you have an advantage. Do you believe that? Sure, sure. And, and I, as a baseball, former baseball player and coach, I know that five runs in the first inning is the same as five runs in the ninth inning. Uh, and and I, I think Republicans, if you look back on history, Republicans used mail ballot voting much more than Democrats prior to 2020. Republican Party has embraced uh, mail ballot uh, use this time around. The the standard bearer has not, but, yeah. but the apparatus has. Well, how about as a baseball player, we all play on the same field, a level playing field. Yeah. Why don't we all just show up election day and we vote? And if you need a mail-in ballot because you're traveling to Europe or you're having surgery that day, then you get one. Yeah. But you don't just get to show up uh, 20 days before and uh, give me a mail-in ballot because I want one. And then you have to worry about ballot harvesting. You know that goes on, too. So, yeah. so we're, we're focused on two things, right? We want secure elections, for sure. Okay. But we also want accessibility. And we want to make sure that folks that do not have traditional schedules, uh, maybe a single mom who's trying to get her kids to daycare, back to work, uh, that she has that access uh, to the ballot at, at any time. And it's a safe process. The early voting period is exactly the same. Now, it's buyer beware. Mm -hmm. If you decide to vote for someone in the first day of early voting, that person may not be on the ballot uh, for obvious reasons. We saw that in the CD1 race. Right. Or something may have happened uh, in the process. You have to know that going in. That's, that's a personal responsibility that you have as an early voter. But, but we want accessibility to be equal with security. All right. And now, uh, uh, speaking of security, mail-in ballots, you know there's something called ballot harvesting. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. Uh, party operatives go around and collect the ballots in nursing homes and places like that and say, give me that, I'll mail it for you, I'll take care of it. I don't think that's a good system, do you? So I, I think one now, of Some states have outlawed that. They don't allow yeah, ballot harvesting. Yeah, or there's, there's limits, yeah. right? Connecticut, I think it's a 10 limit, or, and there's... Oh, look what happened in you Connecticut. Designate people. Look what sure. happened in Bridgeport. Sure, sure, that's yes. against the law. Now, I, I would say this, that, that those ballots are sealed and the signature verification process still goes on. Yep. And those ballots are connected to barcodes that are checked, uh, cross-checked uh, as they come in. So, so those are voted ballots. I mean, that's th because mm. they've been gathered doesn't mean they're not legitimate ballots. But, but look, we, we want to make sure people have confidence uh, in the election system, and, and we're engaged in a series of town halls on Saturday mornings all over the state, asking people to come, at, come in and ask us questions and give uh, them answers. I, I would say that, that you know, uh, most folks who deliver their ballot yes. uh, do so in a way that is, that is secure. They give it to the mailman, uh, they drop it in a drop box, or, or they're giving it to a family member. Uh, and, and so I, I think that's okay. Uh, we want to make sure that those that do not have the ability to right. mail something do have an option uh, for someone to deliver that ballot. Would you discourage uh, somebody giving their ballot to a campaign operative and saying, I'll take care of that, don't worry, give it that to me. So I think one of the great parts... I, I, don't, I don't mind a, a relative taking it, someone you well, trust, some people but you don't know have that's the, not always the case. Right. And, that's not what ballot harvesting is. And I think you would, ha you would have to designate s yeah. specific people. But I think one of the key parts of the Let Rhode Island Vote legislation was to remove the witness and notary uh, from that from that ballot envelope, yes. and that's a good thing because campaigns were paying paying notaries to sign those envelopes, and that put them in the room with the candidate. We want to preserve the private vote for sure, and and, yep. and to hand your ballot to someone is different than having that person influence the ballot. All right. By the way, you're, you do you support this move to allow a 17-year-old teenager to vote in the upcoming primary? which would be in April, yeah. provided they're going to turn 18 by Election Day in November. You think that's a good idea? I don't only support it. I sponsored the bill uh, yeah. in the House of Representatives. Yeah, it, it would align us with 20... Oh, uh, that's how far back you're going yeah, with this. It, yeah. it would align us uh, with 20 other states and the District of Columbia, and, and those states are red, blue, and purple. Um, and it allows that, that young person to be involved in the entire process. They get to choose the person who will be in the general election. So it, it enhances the entire process rather than just a piece of it. You know, some in people, Rhode Island, it's about 2,000 voters, Gene. You have children. I do. Right? Uh, some people, they say 17, that's pretty young. 
you would entrust a 17 year old to make yeah, a decision? Yeah, well, we entrust them to enlist in the military now. That's, a, well, that's the old argument yeah, that goes back to what we gave, what we it's gave a, the It's a good argument. we gave the vote yeah, to the, to the And we entrust them to drive their cars around. Right. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the process for a candidate. You know, we went through this whole thing with the Barack Obama and the birth certificate. What does a candidate have to do to get our ballot? Are on our ballot in Rhode Island. Do they have to show proof of U.S. citizenship, so, a birth certificate? So they have to attest to being a U.S. citizen. Uh, that, there's an attestation that they have to sign on to. And then they need 1,000 uh, registered voters to sign on to their right. nomination forms. They have to be 35 years old. They have to be a citizen of the country for a certain amount of time. Those are the constitutional requirements. And then we saw with the 14th Amendment issue, there were some questions on constitutionality there in Maine and Colorado. That was not the case in Rhode Island. I came out very early and right. said that uh, if President Trump uh, received the 1,000 legitimate signatures, according to Rhode Island law and constitutional law, he would be placed in the ballot and that we did not have a role in making that decision. You never got involved in that. that I didn't. I wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe yeah. talking about uh, the process. But just talk to me a little bit about this. So it doesn't, does a candidate or his representative come to you and say, look, give me the form, and I attest that so-and-so so right. so was born here. He, That's right. he is a naturalized U.S. citizen. That's right. He is uh, a natural U.S. citizen. He is of the age. He meets the criteria, that's right. submit it. That's right. Do you think that's secure enough? Well, I think the folks in your business make sure that's secure enough on the presidential level, for sure. Yes. Um, I, I think the scrutiny is, is so great uh, that, that we know who those candidates are. There is one candidate uh, that filed uh, as a Democrat. Um, and did not uh, get placed in the ballot, and that's the reason. Uh, uh, right. not, not, but, but this person checked off that he was not a citizen All right. and still wanted access to the ballot. Quickly, with just about a minute left, you want millions. Uh, from the state to build an archive, which right. would be sort of a museum, a beautiful place, put our treasures, including copies of the Declaration of Independence, other masterpieces that you have. Right. Sell it in 30 seconds, why it's good. Sure, we're already paying uh, a significant lease to house these documents, uh, but they're not accessible to the public. Uh, so in many states, in most states, you can go and visit the Declaration of Independence. Uh, in our case, we have, we have letters from George Washington, 64 of them. Abraham Lincoln's request right. from troops signed by Abraham Lincoln. Our act of renunciation, right? Our Declaration yeah. of Independence in May. Uh, our, our folks can't access them, and you know, Gene, because you were there, uh, many, many Many hundreds of people came to see the independent yes. man. We know that that will be the case as well. And here's the thing. We're going to have to do this at some point because we're out of space. We're storing 4,000 boxes off-site, and we've got about 15% of these materials that are not being preserved according to best practices. So this is, this is coming down the road. Uh, whether yeah. we do it now or at another time, I'd say that now is the time. You have a spot in mind? We do. Right across the street from the uh, State House on Smith Street in front of the administration building. Right. Another location being considered is the train station location. We think that the, the location across from the State House in, on Smith Street will be the location. You see, now before we went on, I thought I've seen all the documents up at the State House in that standing case. You've seen Bullet the charter. Proof, but, but, You've seen the charter. But we have others oh, even we, more, oh, even more, we, we, maybe more significant we, than that. We just refurbished our copy, only 13, yep. of the Bill of Rights, uh, and it is magnificent. And it is kept. It is kept in the archives, in a drawer. Yeah. Uh, you can see it by appointment, but we should make this accessible. And we know that there will be tourists on a rainy day in Narragansett and Newport. People will come see these documents. They're magnificent. All right. Uh, Secretary of State Greg Amore, thanks for coming in. Good Thank luck you. with the dates coming up and the election coming forward. Thank you, Gene. Okay.